Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. Kenny Holmes and Robert Kraft checking in for another big week. Great week ahead and a great composer on our show today. That's right. This is Score the Podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. Yep. And our guest this week is Nathan Barr. You know him from True Blood, The Americans, The House with the Clock in Its Walls. And uh, he's got a new show coming up in about a month on Amazon, Carnival Row, which is uh, looks really cool. That does look cool. And I think... Nice uh, tie-in with Nathan and Spitfire, our sponsor. I think Nathan has done a a walkthrough of his incredible studio, Bandrika. Yeah, Bandrika. Amazing. What do they call that series? Creative Cribs? Creative Cribs, yeah. Yeah. So it's like when MTV did Cribs back in the day, but now it's all about composer studios. And what a studio to choose to do an episode of, because this place is amazing. And... um, we have a bunch of videos. Make sure to be following us at Score the Podcast on Twitter and at Score Movie on Instagram because we have a bunch of really cool behind the scenes stuff to kind of paint the picture for you because it's hard to explain how amazing this place is uh, without visuals. If you can look up the uh, expression completely over the top amazing, <laughs> you will see a picture of Bandrika because it is truly one of the most exceptional musical recording spaces i've seen with as we'll hopefully get some more information the 20th century fox organ yeah he rescued the 20th century fox organ out of the the scoring stage which went away when scoring stage was rebuilt in 98 so the stage was actually completely redone uh we tried to preserve as a trumpet player said to me as we were rebuilding don't change the dust in the recording room. Yeah. So we rebuilt the control room, but the one thing that was really actually a puzzle was what do we do with this 1928 Wurlitzer organ that's built into the walls and no one knows how to use, play, fix, and P.S., it ends up at Bandrika. He found it. Um, So a lot to get to with Nathan Barr and some headlines, but first we want to tell you about our presenting sponsor, Spitfire Audio. Spitfire makes sample libraries for the world's leading film composers, including many of our guests on the show, like Nathan Barr. Um, They record at London's Air Studios, which was uh, featured in our documentary, and um, so these are the legit musicians playing these these are the legit instruments i mean these are real recordings if you want to elevate your sound this is really the the, you know the 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 place you want to start if you're an aspiring composer if you're a student um, or if you're an existing composer i mean these tools are used by from the pros all the way down to aspiring people who want to get into this industry yeah they have libraries that were put together by hans zimmer they have a library that is uh composed of the sounds of Bernard Herrmann, who was Alfred Hitchcock's composer. So pretty remarkable sa- uh, series of libraries to use. Yeah, and I do want to mention their um, 109-piece orchestra, the Albion One uh, sample pack, which um, right now, if you go to the spitfireaudio.com on their website and use the promo code SCORE, you can save one-third off of Albion One or any of their products. Um, So it's exclusive to our listeners, and uh, you want to take advantage of that now because it's a limited time only. So just go to spitfireaudio.com and then pick whatever you want to uh, add to your library and then just use the promo code. I think the promo code is SCORE is my guess, and it's a third off, 33 and a third. One of the nicest things about having Spitfire as our sponsor is when we mention to someone, oh, our sponsor is Spitfire, the response is always, oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's always upbeat, and uh, they have such a great reputation. So I can't imagine that getting a third off on one of those libraries is anything That's but a great. big deal. Yeah, great deal. Um, and stick around. After the show, we're going to play you an example of how Spitfire can elevate your music. They provided some sample cues of uh, some of the instruments in their different sample packs. And uh, thanks to those who sent in some examples of how you use Spitfire. Make sure to do that, um, and we'll check it out, and maybe we'll retweet it, or uh, we'll definitely check it out. Uh, I listened to a couple of those, and I thought, oh, my God, there are people out there 
that are composing film music with Spitfire that is real and kind of contenders for like these folks should be scoring movies. Maybe they'll be on our show one day. Oh, that's nice. Um, so let's get to some of the topics of this week. Um, the Lion King comes out this weekend and the critics have ripped it apart like a lion would in the desert or I guess I the jungle, like the, visuals. <laughs> the desert, they say, they say desert lions. They, um, That's my California coming out here. I think they feel that the visuals are extraordinary, but it doesn't go anywhere past the wonderful original film. And I guess it wasn't even intended to. They made the, they remade it. Yeah. I think my, my thought in going into this is, is when I go see it, first off, I haven't seen the Lion King in probably 15, 20 years. I have no idea. When did it, it, it came out like 20 years ago, right? I'm going to go with 20. I'm not going to watch it right before because I feel like a lot of the critic reviews that I've read are literally ripping it apart for it being a shot by shot remake. And I think the audience is going to like it because it's just a new take on a great story. And, you know, the jungle book did really well and it, it was impressive and, all the reviews I've read, people are like, you forget sometimes that you're watching something fake after a while because it looks so real. And it was well cast. That was another thing that a lot of the reviews said, you know, Seth Rogen and John Oliver and uh, Donald Glover. Everyone did a great job. But they, they keep going back to the kind of ripping Disney and, you know, uh, being a money grab and the, and this sort of thing. And I think they call that laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, exactly. So I'm sure the movie's great. I didn't think the critics were going to give it a good chance anyway, just because this is now the, what, third or fourth live action remake, and they're not doing anything to change anything as far as the story, which why would they? It's it's incredible story. And um, the soundtrack is out today too. Beyonce's record actually uh and the single that she has from the film is getting incredible reviews and incredible traction. And it's, I haven't heard it. It's apparently a fantastic song, gospel flavored and very inspiring. So, uh, how could it not be? It's yeah, Beyonce. It's the queen bee. And I also heard a nice little clip of Seth Rogen being interviewed about what it was like to sing. He said, well, I had Hans Zimmer and Pharrell helping me in the studio. So how bad could that be? They're pretty good. So yeah. that'll be fun to hear. And as we heard, Seth, uh, he's a hard worker and he, he, he goes hundred percent on everything. Um, after we heard that from Chris Leonard's last week, that's right. So I'm sure I'll get to Lion King shortly and, um, I bet I'll enjoy it. I'm going to watch it. I yeah. think it's going to be great. And, and, I, and the music hasn't changed. Yep. It's it there. I mean, I'm sure the, the orchestra will be a little more rich and they'll change a little arrangements here and there but i i swept through the the score this morning and um i got the same feels from a lot of those cues i can can i actually say i think the real summary of how we both feel about lion king is hakuna matata <laughs> my brother hey how about that thing you told me about at royal albert hall that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. So um if you follow either david arnold or michael Giacchino on twitter they have been ramping this concert up now for at least a month, um, but they're really doing a good job in in marketing this. I don't know if this was just their idea or if it was the idea of the concert from the beginning, but there's like movie posters that make it look like Independence Day and Royal Albert Hall is blowing up or there's lasers coming down at it. Both of their faces are on each side of the poster like the movie Face Off right. with the... Uh, who was in Face Off? Uh, it was Travolta Cage and, and, Cage. and Cage. Yeah, yeah it kind of looks like that poster. Um, but I don't know if they're going to fight to the death at the end or if it's all going to be music. Fight club between two composers. <laughs> but I like the title, Settling the Score. Yeah. I, I just wish that they uh, would do it in, in the States. I bet they will. I bet if this goes well. It says, playing 18 classic scores from the two composers performed by the Royal Philharmonic concert orchestra it'll be interesting i uh i've had the privilege of working with both of them and they're very different i did uh worked on independence day with david one of his first scores here and i did a couple movies with michael one of them was called the family stone mm. and he had a very unique way of working um 
So it'll be interesting to to hear. They both have a couple really big scores to pull out in the late rounds of the settling. The yeah, score. I mean, David Arnold has all the D- James Bond, Bond stuff. jacquino has got Star Trek, Star Wars. And then at one point he just goes... Make everyone cry with up at the end. Yeah, so it's going to be. Oh, well, that, that's I hope that's October eighteenth. If you're looking for a vacation spot in October, that would be a fun stop on uh, on a trip for sure. Uh, Damien Chazelle's new script is being shopped. Uh, it's called Babylon. He's rumored to have Emma Stone star in it, which isn't surprised. And I would assume that that would be Justin Hurwitz's next big film project. I. Other, unless there's something we don't know. but And I wonder how musical Babylon will be. It takes place in the 20s, so um, I don't know if she'll be singing um, or if it will be... She definitely a, proved that she musical. can. Love. And sang live in Loved La La Land. Loved hearing her so. sing in La La Land and that great and story. And Justin said they had a good uh, chemistry, so yep. and, that'll be cool. Uh, I, I read this morning that... that Baz Luhrmann, who did two pictures at Fox, Romeo and Juliet, actually three, sorry, Romeo and Juliet, the epic Moulin Rouge, and then Australia, uh, is now going after a project that he talked about years ago, which is an Elvis biopic. Mm. And he found a kid to play Elvis, got a young actor named Austin Butler. And I was trying to look him up. Was he a Disney kid? Or? I believe he, he might have been a Disney kid. I think he's an animated person. Gotcha. So I know that he's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't know what kind of oh, um, role he has, but I saw his name on the IMDb he's list. He's having one of those summers that uh, I think all actors dream about, and all I can hope is that it continues for him, because if he's in a Quentin Tarantino movie, and about to be in a Baz Luhrmann movie, he's starting playing off, Elvis, right, mind you, on a rocket ship. And God bless him. Hopefully, but, he doesn't hit Heartbreak Hotel. Oh wow! Do if you, know, you know what I'm saying? Do you know what's amazing about Heartbreak Hotel? No, is that I actually did an Elvis movie once called Heartbreak Hotel. It was shot in Austin, Texas, starring David Keith as Elvis. And I think, with all due respect to the director Christopher Columbus, who then went on went on to do Home Alone as his next movie. The less said about Heartbreak Hotel, the better. But I did have some fun at... <laughs> the uh, name wasn't just clever. I went to Austin Recording Company, ARC, and recorded Elvis songs, and it was really fun. Really fun movie to work on. I don't know how well it did. Speaking of doing well, there were a couple wipeouts this weekend yeah what is going on stuber which i realize is about a guy named Stu who drives an uber uh i didn't know that that's where the name came from uh did not do well which is concerning hollywood hugely because these kind of mid-level mid-expense comedies are the cop buddy right they're just not connecting the way of course these it's either a huge movie or a freaky indie movie. That's what's happening. Or some documentaries. Mm-hmm. That's what's working. But the mid-budget comedy, which was a huge part of Hollywood's movie-going diet. Well, two big stars. You had Dave Batista yeah. and Kamel Nanjiani. Yep. Um, both, you know, Dave Batista, of course, in Guardians of the Galaxy, and, and Kumail coming off of the big sick. Yep. So they had a lot of hype there. Just didn't work. Far From Home, Spider-Man movie, and Toy Story just wiped everybody out. Uh, and so... It's hard to fight against I think you always hope that counter-programming like that, will work. That there'll be something in the marketplace you go, I'm not going to go to a big superhero movie. I'll go to a little comedy, and that'll be fun. Uh, only one of those movies is working, and it's Yesterday is actually working yeah. and doing well at the box office. Uh, it seems like Stuber, though, has the same audience as Spider-Man and maybe, maybe Toy Story. Maybe not Toy Story, but Spider-Man for sure, like a, you know. Young male. Young male audience, and, you know, it's just it's tough to, to fight against something like that. Didn't happen. Is Crawl, the movie with the alligators that we <laughs> talked so, about, yeah. also didn't do well? I guess the alligators just weren't that hungry. They didn't show up and eat enough of the lady who was trapped under the... Um, the house. <laughs> there's, uh, of course, we mentioned this coming up this weekend. Lion King will dominate, no question about it. Yep, um, and a really cool documentary coming out, which I've been so excited to see, which is Cameron Crowe produced 
the David Crosby documentary called Remember My Name, directed by A.J. Eaton. It's supposed to be phenomenal, and I really am excited about it, particularly after seeing, Kenny, I don't know if you've been watching on CNN, there's a new series called The Movies. And, Is that uh, after they did the all the decades? All the, the 80s, 90s, No, 70s, I haven't. Right. The Movies just started. I saw the first two episodes, which are the 80s, and then the 90s in movies, and the 90s are dominated by Cameron Crowe, and I'd forgotten about Jerry Maguire and Almost Famous and these mm. incredible films that he did, so I'm going to be very interested to see Crosby. By the way, that series, a real home run, if only because it's two hours per decade, and you go through every movie, you go, oh, I'd forgotten how great that was, every single one. Nice. So I'll have to check that out. Really I, I love watching stuff like that because you just have like, first off, you have all the the moments, the nostalgic moments, but then you almost want to like make a list and go rewatch everything. That Ned, you Ned Ryerson. <laughs> they do a bit out of Groundhog Day and they do, they do a whole Bill Murray sequence, which is great. Um, another movie that's coming out this weekend that um, has gotten a lot of buzz and the reviews are fantastic. It's called The Art of Self-Defense with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and... It's about a kind of a goofy guy who doesn't have a lot of confidence and he he goes to a karate class and um, everything goes crazy after that. But the trailer, it it looks really funny and the review, I think it has like a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes. Nice. um, So I definitely want to see that. I don't know about in theaters. It's hard to get me to the theater lately. This weekend I finished, finally finished When They See Us and I finished Stranger Things and I've just come to the conclusion that for me TV is just better right now it's so and it's, awesome a lot of these movies finish in the theater and they come to the streaming streaming service and i'm i'm just more prone to waiting with how many flops that are coming out you and everyone else um you know yesterday was the first movie in a while that i saw that was in, in the theater that i i really really dug it and um you know but I, so I, much energy and so much brilliance in the new series, there's no question. HBO, Netflix, Showtime, and they just Hulu. keep. Co- I mean, Succession season two is coming Can't soon. Wait. And um, what was the one that we? Uh, I'm I'm deep catch on catch twenty two. Yes, I mean some of these. Should I'm bury. deep on Handmaid's Tale again. I got back yeah. in and uh, kind of like one of those series where <sighs> I have to wait till Wednesday to see the next one. I can't wait. How do I do it? Yeah. So it's. Uh, it's so well done. And I'm just, I'm hoping Once Upon a Time in Hollywood rescues the summer. Oh, please. Since Endgame, I don't think we've had a, a monster. I guess Toy Story did, it was, it did well. I haven't seen it, but um, I'm sure it's great though. Uh, I just feel like for me, I guess maybe it's the scheduling too. Like you can sit down and watch one episode. A lot of the movies now, they just keep getting longer to two and a half, three hours. TV is just killing it Parking. for me right now. Popcorn. <laughs> yeah, it, it racks up. Yeah. Um, but I'm not completely discouraged, and I have faith in film. Great. I'm going to stick with you on that. Um, so we are going to take a break. Coming up after the break, we will head over to Bandrika Studios with our guest this week, Nathan Barr. Yeah. And um, yeah, we do man. want to remind our listeners as well, if you can help us out, we are eligible for nomination for the podcast awards for 2019. Super excited about that. Um, but we can't do it without you. So if you can take just a quick moment, go over to podcastawards.com. Super easy to remember. It's an award for podcasts. Podcastawards.com. And uh, you register really fast. It's like name and email. It's not, they don't need your social security number or anything like that. And uh, you jump on there. We're eligible in two categories, people's choice and TV and film. Not music. I actually, uh, here's a big, I hope this is okay. I actually voted for score the podcast, Mm. but I looked for it in music and found out it's in TV and film, which is where it should be. That's what we're talking about. We talk about music, but we talk about TV and film as well. So on, you got a few extra minutes listener. You get all those great emails and tweets from everybody saying how much they love the show. Give it up a little shout out, a little love. We'll, We'll take it. So please do that. If you have the time, it just takes a couple minutes and, um, hopefully we can, Bring home uh, some hardware from the podcast yeah, awards. Baby. Yeah, man. Much more to come. Stick around after the break. 
Nathan Barr is up next. Hey, SCORE fans, it's Robert Kraft. We're back to the show in 25 seconds. If you like what you're hearing, do us a quick favor. Rate and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. It just takes a second, and it helps the show grow. Hey, thanks. We're going back to the show right now. Hey, this is Chris Bowers. You're listening to SCORE, the podcast. Now back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. We are inside Bandrika Studios, and this place is, I mean, a field trip location, a museum. I don't... I think Nathan Barr is our guest today, and thank you so much for having us inside this mecca. I am really surprised that you haven't started selling tickets to this studio. It's it's funny. We do do silent film concerts here a couple times a year and sell tickets. It's... Almost, I know that a podcast is audio only. We're going to be posting, of course, some visuals. Oh, there's going to, yeah, make sure to follow us at Score the Podcast on Twitter and uh, Score Movie on Instagram because I have my phone is running out of space. We've been walking around just checking out this place. It's nice. It's really uh, epic what you've built here. Thank you. And uh, I want to take a quick second to congratulate you on being one of the newest members of the Academy, by the way. Oh, thank you. I wanted to send you you a note last night. I couldn't (laughs) find your email address to say, welcome to the music branch. Thank you so much. Very cool. Thank you. It's overdue. They're also going to have to have a uh, music technology branch just for you. (laughs) And so let me set the scene for the listeners because we are in a very large room. You might hear a little echo, um, but right behind Nathan is... The original Wurlitzer from the Fox Studio, right from Fox Scoring Stage, and yep. the and the pipes are running underneath the floor and all around us up into an upstairs. What looks like you you are in the 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 guts of the Titanic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's yeah. massive. Can you tell us first off? I mean. Your assistants were telling me that you used to work out of your garage, yep. and um, you've upgraded a little bit. A little Can bit. you tell us about this studio and and what we're sitting in? Yeah, so this is a this is a space I imagined when I moved out here twenty years ago. Um, I, I imagined a room with a big room with a lot of uh, unusual musical instruments uh, that where I could make music for movies and TV. And um, it was uh, seven years in the making, and the uh, instrument, I, I thought, how can I, there's so many studios closing, as we know, great studios, and the excitement about live music is, is in, a, in a way, at least recorded live music, is leaving Los Angeles, so I thought, what can I do to make this a special space that really announces itself as something different? I always loved pipe organs, I was just fascinated by them, and so... Um, I tumbled down this. I did this uh, one of Netflix's first shows ever. It was called Hemlock Grove. It was the three season show. And I um, read in the script about this old mansion and something brought to my mind this museum in Wisconsin. Have you guys heard of House on the Rock? No. It's this utterly bizarre museum that this guy just collected stuff. Like he has a room full of full size carousels. And you go as a kid and you're like, this is so cool. And you go as an adult and you're like, this is so weird and strange <laughs> and messed up. And uh, he had, uh, so, so that, that mechanical musical instrument uh, sort of fascination started with that film. So I went and visited a lot of these collections and I said, D- does anyone know, like, are there any available? And this guy's, well, oh, Ken Chrome up in Reno, he's an organ uh, builder. He owns the Fox organ. And I'm like, what do you mean the Fox organ? <clears throat> They're like, well, there was a, there was an organ on the scoring stage. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, Paramount had one, Universal had one, they, uh, uh, everyone had one. And so uh, I found out about this this guy up in Reno, and I flew up there to go see it. And he, I said, where is it? I didn't know the size of it at this point either. And he started throwing open door after door in this warehouse, just just floor to ceiling stacks of boxes. And he told me it was the organ for the Sound of Music. Not as not as as exciting. When you see it in boxes. No, no, no. <laughs> Probably looks more like a headache. Yeah. yeah well, I, the minute the doors opened, I, I, I thought, this is insane. And I don't <laughs> care how I do it, I have to do it. Because this is such a piece of film music history, totally forgotten about. Um, it, it was used by Bernard Herrmann uh, in uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Uh, John Williams used it in Empire of the Sun and Home Alone and um, Witches of Eastwick. Um, Alex North has used it. Dimitri Tiomkin. Literally anyone who came through Fox... Uh, of the, the the sort of greats over the years, if they recorded a score on the stage that needed an organ, of course they used the organ. 
So it was, it was just this like aha moment, like this is what is going to make this studio special and sharing it with the world and, and, uh, and getting it back into film and television music where it belongs. Cause it was, it was, uh, last used, I think on, I've heard mixed things like Bruce Broughton may, may have been the, one of the last ones to use it. Um, but well, it was I, last I came to Fox in 94 and it wasn't used. In fact, it, then, I mean, we'd stopped using it. And of course in 95, I was informed that they were going to take the scoring stage and we're thinking about maybe turning it into offices. You know, we needed more cubicles on the lot. And here was this epic wow. stage one. And we lobbied to keep it. And there were some compromises. And one of them was, why would we keep this enormous organ? We have to sell it. And Mike Noblock, to his credit, said, we, it's incredibly valuable and historic. But one of the compromises just in rebuilding the whole room was that space had to go. My question is, there seems to be a little distance from the boxes in that warehouse to the beautiful, (laughs) incredible studio we're in with this organ set up like you've walked into a museum, but it works, everything works. Did you have to find a space first or did you have the space? I had to find a space first. I was, as many composers can attest to, you know, it starts out as a 500 square foot, um, you know, addition to the current studio and then it turns into this. Right. So I, I looked around, um, for about five months to find a building that fulfilled a couple of requirements. The main one being, could I have a, a large, large enough room to make having the organ here worth it? Yeah. It's a smaller room. It doesn't sound great. Uh, and then did it have the the space for the actual structure of the organ, which is huge. You know, it occupies six rooms. And so uh, when I found this building in a quiet neighborhood, uh, w- which was largely open floor plan, we still gutted it. I was like, this is, this is, this is it. Like I just walked on, I walked into the front doors and I'm like, oh my God, this is it. We're done. We're done. Deal. <laughs> yeah. And and you've um, not only taken this and repurposed it in, in, to using it today, but you've also upgraded it and mm-hmm. digitized it. Can you tell us about how that came about? And I mean, this isn't some, has this been done before or did you invent this? Not to this extent. Um, I, I wanted to be able to sit at my writing rig and pull up tracks and logic and actually program parts for the pipe organ. And to this extent, it's never been done. Um, I played for you guys before a little bit of an arpeggiator through We're the gonna organ. We're going to have to get some recording of that. Incredible. Yeah, it, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty sequence. amazing to think about 2019 talking to 1928 and it took a lot of programming and and interfacing with a guy who built the system back in the 80s that that allows you to capture anyone who sits down at the console if they hit record it's going to record as MIDI information anything they do, pedals, stops, keys, everything, buttons. And then when they're done, they just hit stop, hit play again, and the organ literally spits out the performance. And it just turns into a player piano, Exactly, exactly. And, and so what I can do now in Logic, which I've been doing, is we'll have the seven mics up in here that we use to record the organ, and I'll just sit there and, and pull up. A, I, I, for each set of pipes, it's called a rank, I have a track, and I enable the track, and then I can sit in my control room and play it, hear it through. <laughs> Program it. And what's so funny, you know, on the piano roll page, when you grab a note and move it around, mm-hmm. so you do that here, and it's like, woo, and it's playing all the pipes in here. Oh, it's that fantastic. is crazy. And that is, that is the coolest thing. That's when you really hear 2019 talking to 1928. But and the, you, the have the, you have the Fox thing, the, the, the fanfare. You have the Fox fanfare yeah. saved in there. Can, can you play that right now? Yeah, sure. Is that, is that easy to fire? Yeah, it's easy. It's right here. And we can. I, do I have the, to stand up and salute when I hear it? That's usually my response to that kind of music. <laughs> Here it is. This is my friend Mark Herman playing this. Thank you. Alfred Newman, nice. as you know, wrote that for another movie studio, and uh, they rejected it, so it came to Fox as the fanfare. I think one of the most remarkable things that I'm seeing this morning, not only this organ, which in itself, truly Smithsonian caliber. This is, of, this is the Barsonian. Yeah, it is. <laughs> nice. But um, there are other instruments here. You played us a... Uh, 
what was it? A sympathetic, s- sympathetic drone cello. Yeah, a sympath- sympathetic drone cello. It, I mean, if I'm feeling sad, is it sympathetic in a way <laughs> that I could come over and sit with it for a It'll little while? It'll cuddle you. You can. <laughs> you can. But clearly, you have a fascination with um, the technology of music as well as the composition of music. Has that always been? Tell us a little bit when you first found yourself. I mean, did you look at a piano and then after you played it, open the lid to see how the hammers work? When did that start? Yeah, as a kid I did, absolutely. I was always fascinated by how things worked musically. And strangely, I never like gravitated sort, sort of the synth side of musical technology. I always liked like a real instrument, not real instrument, but an instrument with strings or that air passed through or chimes or whatever, and then kind of like taking it apart a bit and, and, and understanding it better. And so the period of, of instrument uh, history for musical instruments that, that I naturally gravitated towards, which I didn't even know about until about 10 years ago, was, was automatic musical instruments. It was a period between sort of the late 19th century, early 20th century, where mm. people, before recorded music was viable in a, in a large space, these genius level inventors figured out how to play real instruments mechanically using a role player mechanism. So violins, uh, you know, marimbas, pianos, it's all based on actually this technology of the organ. Yeah. Cause yeah. the organ I learned going up into room number 612, <laughs> the steam room, the steam room is not only, of course I'd forgotten. It's not only just pipes. There's a marimba, there's mm-hmm. a xylophone, there's, Maracas, the sleigh bells. It's it's a it's it's the major one of the major things that differentiates it from a, a church organ. Most people think of a church organ as pipes, and maybe there are a couple chimes that they'll hear. But uh, when Wurlitzer Wurlitzer was at the forefront of of making instruments that could be installed in silent film movie theaters, that would bring an enormous amount of emotion and and a whole another level of of the experience of watching a film. And so they said, how can we put as many instruments into the walls and chambers as we can and give one person a possibility to play it? So what you saw in those six rooms, this is amazing, Wurlitzer was churning out one organ a day. And it was going into a boxcar off to some theater in the United States somewhere throughout the 20s and early 1900s. And um, there were 3,000 people working at the factory in North Tonawanda, New York, upstate New York. And uh, they could literally turn around uh, uh, one of these a day. And it's thousands of parts. And the incredible thing is they're still in perfect shape. Like they're hel- they hold up. This is very rare. Yeah. So this is the, the reason this is, this is such a special instrument for a couple reasons. One, it's, it's history in Hollywood. Two is it was uh, installed in 28 and it stayed until 98. So it was literally in like a shrink wrapped hmm. box, you know, it, it, which is so rare. Warner brothers lost its organ back in the fifties. And what unfortunately hobbyists oftentimes pulled them out and restored them. And that was the beginning of the end of their lives. So the fact that this was, kept so beautifully and most importantly when when fox sold it that the guy who removed it knew how to remove a pipe organ um makes it as beautiful as it is we googled <clears throat> dudes who know how to remove pipe <laughs> yeah, <organs. exactly. laughs> and one guy yeah. in reno came up <laughs> um but also i want to hear more about your fascination with the technology and how did that interface with composing because yeah. Clearly, it influences how you write. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like a means to an end. Like the drone cello um, that we're talking about is 10 sympathetic strings, five main strings, and then four drone strings that are played by a mechanical hurdy-gurdy wheel on the cello. And that was just like born out of like, I would love to be able to sit here and not play back a recorded drone, pre-recorded drone. I'd love to sit here and actually have this thing do it all and and just just really vibe off that. And so that's how that thing came about. And then, like, again, means to an end. Like, okay, I've got this organ here. I don't play pipe organ. There are some great players in town. I can get them over here, but how do I experiment with it? <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's get logic hooked up to it, and that way I can do whatever I want, go way beyond the capabilities of a player, which is sort of what's really exciting about this instrument as well, and, and then make it happen that way. Um, so, yeah, it's just like a... a um, it's a, it's a way from I, I'm a cellist and a guitarist. I can kind of play some piano stuff, but um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I can't play, and this kind of helps me access that stuff as a composer. Because what is composing? It's improvising, you know. And the, the the more efficiently and creatively I can improvise on something I don't play, the cooler it's going to be when it comes out as a composition. That was my next question, and you kind of answered it. But um, <clears throat> you're a guitarist and a and a cello player. But what was your what is your background? Um, 
getting into film music? Were you in a band? Did you know you wanted to be a film composer or did this kind of happen organically? What, what, how did that all start? Yeah. I mean, I always loved film music uh, and TV music. I came out here in 96. I was reading scripts, doing coverage. I hated it. Um, and then one day I actually, I did this crazy trip, which is kind of akin to this organ. A friend and I bought a school bus in 96 and we drove it from New York to Brazil, 16,300 miles. Right on. Everyone told us we were insane, that we'd never survive. And I kind of got the same feedback when I was putting, putting this organ in, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Like, this is crazy. What are you doing? And so um, I think uh, that that um, interest in sort of doing something really different um, um, is, is a big part of my process. Uh, so when I came out here, uh, when I came back from that trip, I was running packages around town, no idea what was next. And someone said, hey, Hans Zimmer is looking for a, an assistant. So I, I, you know, I went over there and uh, became one of the many who went through Media Ventures at the time. And I was there pretty briefly. I was there eight months. And, and uh, I learned a lot. I knew nothing about anything when I walked in there. And and then I got an agent and, and said, I want to really do this on my own. So how, how, When you <clears> went into that door, though, did you have any film composing experience? Nothing. Nothing. I so never, what, what was your sell? How did you get in my, that door? Honestly, what's funny, that trip. I heard years later, Hans said something to the effect of like, you know, anyone who's done a trip like that is worth getting to know better. So this, this thing that was a lark and, and, and many thought, many people thought a dangerous one turned into this calling card, which was totally unexpected. And I don't, I, I think that's probably true because my friend who told me he's a very good friend of Hans's, but that I think, and, and I think also Hans just wanted to be able to sit in a car with someone all day and not be driven nuts. So it was a personality thing. But I guarantee <laughs> I was the last person to walk through the doors into that job who didn't know what MIDI stood for. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I knew that. nothing. <laughs> I love that. And look where you are today. Has yeah. Hans seen the, the organ? He has not yet. Oh, no. He, no. I emailed Hans him Zimmer. about it. Yeah. Come out to Bandrika Studios. Mm-hmm. You see what you inspired. <laughs> there's, I, we we got here and it was like, we got to set up. Hold on, there's this. Hold on, there's that. We're, we're going to, we got to post videos of this and i think uh spitfire um they d- spitfire audio our our presenting partner they did a video creative cribs yep creative, cribs. creative cribs on youtube if you look it up it's a it's like a half hour or 40 minutes long it's a really super extensive look at the whole place and the facility the instruments um and then output has done something here um yeah so it's cool wow can't wait creative yeah. cribs does lots of composers yes a lot yeah, a lot. They've done. They've done. They do a really wonderful job of sort of like you know looking at a looking in depth at studios. This must be the number one episode. I don't know because this is the most creative <laughs> crib I've seen in a long time. I just love I don't it. Know. Thank it's you. It's really remarkable. I think we should maybe take a minute to move towards your composing because you're. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the ridiculous part, and it's sort of like, oh yeah, that. Here's this studio that is off the charts, world class, world class instruments, world class technology. And by the way, you're scoring some huge shows and another big one coming up, which we just heard a little bit yeah. about. Yeah. You ever to talk about? Yeah. What, yeah. What's what's coming up? Um, so uh, coming up uh, August 30th is Carnival Row. It's a new show on Amazon. It's really wonderful. I'm so excited about it. It's uh, Orlando Bloom, Cara Delevingne, and it, it was like sort of custom made for this studio i was about to say right? to hear you the know? to hear the theme which we just heard moments ago <laughs> did they say we got to get that guy who owns the organ no it was so that's funny. insane because it's a carnival sound i know i know it's very funny how that happens i think it's the whole if you build it they will come so. by the way i'm driving from new york to brazil after the show <laughs> just, <laughs> just in case so much magic seems to <laughs> accrue yeah, the magic there school bus that's the real that's the right. true story go that's ahead right. you were saying how it happened so uh let's see so there were two editor picture editors i worked with on true blood um uh and then another film years ago and they were two of the three editors on the show and said we should get nate in here and i met with them and sort of pitched what i would do and they loved it and um i didn't uh have the organ quite set up yet when i started this so it was wow. like a a thing and the interesting thing is so I did a movie last year called The House of the Clock and Its Walls mm-hmm. and one of the crazy things about this film and this experience was it was literally the perfect in- reintroduction of this instrument into film music the film did really well it was set in a time when these would have still been kind of you know, around 
And we were racing to get this place done and the organ installed to be able to record the score here with the orchestra. So it was like this mad dash with this space. And I always thought like, okay, this I'm going to put this in. It's going to sit here for a year and hopefully it'll get used somewhere. And literally the day we finished, I think the day after we finished, we got an orchestra in here, played with the organ. Um, so anyhow, uh, let's see. I just finished a f- another film with Amblin called The Turning, which comes out in January. Mm. Um, I uh, did a show called Fosse Verdon, uh, which is on FX. The, uh, and then uh, I did just did a show that just came out called The Rook on stars. Are you uh, making an effort to use the organ as much as you can everywhere? And I sneak it in everywhere. Like there are, uh, I think, uh, uh, Robert can, can attest to this, that when you heard that you didn't necessarily think, Oh, this is a pipe organ, right? In that track. All. Yeah. So that's the cool thing. So I'm literally putting it in everywhere. I think I was outside. <clears throat> I got to hear this track. So the carnival yeah. row theme is whirlits are heavy. It's all Wurlitzer, a single fiddle and choir. And, and and when you really listen to it and think about it in those terms, the organ is filling up an enormous amount of space and doing it so beautifully. The, 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 one of the discoveries about this instrument that's been so cool is if you just sprinkle a couple other instruments into the track with the organ, your ear absolutely thinks it's hearing an orchestra. Like It's, oh, it's so cool. It's so a uh, wonderful kind of analog <clears throat> approach yes. to what people do with sort of synth sounds and they put a clarinet over it so they think maybe people won't yeah. hear it but you're doing it with an authentic that's it instrument that's it and this is a this is a synth orchestra from 1928 you know, exactly this, right this, i mean you that's know? you, you uh, figure they used to use these to fill up a whole theater those huge theaters radio city music hall exactly. still has its pipe organ it's 58 yep. ranks it's like three times the size of this oh, wow. so are you getting better you said you, you're not a, a piano player but i imagine you're fiddling with this enough to where you're yeah. you're getting better i would imagine yeah and i can play uh a track at a time on the organ and multi-track that and, what's uh, interesting yeah. about you saying you're not a piano player i think we have the true blood love theme here right is that i assumed when i heard it. oh that's funny that's not me oh <laughs> you're supposed to say actually yeah that's me no, I had. it's uh, elizabeth scott who's a, who's a really good friend of mine and she played that but uh, you had to write it i did I did. And, yeah, um, yeah. And, I, a, and honestly, you'll hear p- anywhere you hear piano in a lot of my scores, I am playing it, but I'm not the, the guy who can sit down and play through an entire piece unless I okay, really Okay, this practice. is a relief. I think we need a news bulletin that Nathan can't do absolutely everything <laughs> incredibly right. well. <laughs> right. um, and I'm, my other guess is you're probably being modest mm. um, because th- that piano cue is wonderful. And Thanks. it's actually pianists usually write for piano and so the fact that you're not and you wrote that cue yeah. with a kind of a piano focus uh is interesting i thought it was just beautiful thanks you've been you've been a part of a couple of shows that you know sometimes people get on a show and it, it doesn't last throughout there but you've been lucky to get yeah. shows that go all the way through and get an ending yes um, it's true and the americans is one that yep. people were not only glad that it got to an ending but they were happy with it this yeah, is kind of a thing true. now where people are like oh this is the best show ever and then it ends and it just ruins everything yeah. of the the history of it um when when you first got on to the americans this it's kind of like crossing all over genres it's action it's drama you got russia you got the 80s you got politics um w- did you have a vision for that when it when you first read it or or saw the the, did. the first cut yeah, I did. Um, I, I'll show you guys another instrument before you leave today. Uh, it's, I call it my butchered piano, and it's an upright piano that I had, a piano tech saw in half, and it can be, there you go, flipped up on its back. And this is actually using Come that instrument. On. The melody, it's in there. It sounds like a dulcimer or something, but it's not. It's actually this piano. So that became a central sound to the, uh, to the, to the show. Um, should I keep talking? Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, I cool. love it. All right. and- so, I'd like you to talk about that flatted fifth too. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I remembered. I love the scores. Um, uh, the original taking of Pelham one, two, three, and you know David Shire, and I kind of thought of like that as like a jumping off point. So I wrote a demo that was about seven minutes of this kind of stuff for them, and they just you know flipped out over it and hired me. So, yeah, it was kind of like uh, that was the inspiration, and we all decided we didn't want it to be like Red Army Choir. You know, that was a little <laughs> too, too on the nose. Basil Polidorus and <laughs> yeah. Hunter Red October. 
So yeah, exactly. So 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 we basically uh, I just sort of found my way to, into something that was really electric bass heavy, which is fun. There's some fun like uh, multi rhythm stuff with electric bass, and then a lot of that piano was in there. I played with mallets and hammers, and I started using that piano on True Blood because the action sequences wanted a big sound without being orchestral, and that seemed to fill sonically the space in a really nice way. When you say you wrote a demo. <clears throat> Um, was it this theme? Uh, it, you know, it's funny enough, this theme was in there. Yeah, was that's this theme. I don't know how other composers are. I think some of them are the same. Like when I used to, am writing a demo, when I figure out a project's coming up, oftentimes the very first thing I play when I sit down, I don't even know what it's going to be, becomes the thing. It's so weird. It's actually a funny uh, bit <laughs> about that. I've often been in the case where the composer will play the very first thing, the studio or the director or the producer will say, yeah, what else do you have? You go through 16 other iterations, <laughs> and then somewhere two weeks later, someone says, what was that first thing you played us? <laughs> and there are so many instances where the composer's first instinct mm-hmm. is spot on, but the nervous filmmakers think there's other things to look at. And uh, yeah, it's, so it's true. one of my two two lessons that I learned about listening to a composer and I think after a little break, we'll come back with lesson two and maybe hear a little bit from one of Nathan's other great scores. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, score fans. It's Kenny. Now that season two is going strong, you can look good while you're listening. We just released the official Score the Podcast t-shirt. There's multiple colors and sizes for men, women, and children. And they're super soft. I just got a few myself. They fit really nice and they feel great and they look cool. Uh, so go to score-movie.com slash store, check those out, and you can also get a copy of Score, a film music documentary on Blu-ray, and our uh, interview bonus disc that has the extended interviews from the film. So plenty to check out, score-movie.com slash store, and get your shirt today. Hey, this is Bear McCreary. You're listening to Score the Podcast. Now back to the show. Welcome back inside Bandrika Studio. This is Score the Podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. And this is that True Blood cue we were talking about. Yeah, it's a love theme for Bill and Sookie. It was the first thing I wrote, again. <laughs> was yeah. it played on the piano in this room? No, guitar. It was played on guitar in 2008, a long time ago. I played it for Alan Ball, and uh, he was quiet, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to fire it off this thing. And, and he goes, I, I, I really feel something for them now that I wasn't feeling before. So it was oh, a great compliment. That's the, the greatest, ultimate, right? The, the greatest, <laughs> the greatest aspect of any piece of music is that the composer has somehow revealed something about the character or the story right. that enhances and develops what you're seeing on screen. I mean, that's really what it is where the music suddenly uncovers some level of emotion that you go, oh, <gasps> Wow, she's, yes. she's kind of sad, and I never realized that. One yep. of those things. Yep. Rule number two that I mentioned, yeah. first rule is sometimes a composer's first instinct, spot on, listen to it carefully before you go away. Rule number two is the exact opposite, which is when you've heard all the cues from a composer for a film or for a particular scene, always ask, do you have one more? Because they always have something in their kit bag that they're a little embarrassed to play because they think it's so wrong. (laughs) And they play it, and you go, that's it. Nailed it. (laughs) Nailed it. It's happened so many times where either the composer volunteers, and my memory is of an incredible movie I was working on with Patrick Doyle, the great one, and we were having trouble with one scene and one scene and one scene, and everybody had left the room. And he said, ah, it's one other thing I was, I didn't want to play. I said, well, play it for me. Let's hear it. I had to go run out in the hallway and say, everybody come <laughs> back. We just heard our theme. That's hilarious. So um, Amazing. That's just great. What's your, can you t- take us through your writing process? Um, a lot, most composers we talk to write on a piano, but you said you're a guitar right. first. Does that, I imagine that process is a little different writing on a guitar. Is it more like full chords as opposed to keys? And I'm not a musician, so this right. is this is all new to me. I mean, I do write. I write at my keyboard a lot at the, in the writing room, but but I guess where I'm pretty different is like we always have mics set up in here, 
in a natural part of the very beginnings is to be in here with the organ or some of these other weird instruments and just start making sounds to them and trying to find things. I think I find my way to some of my best work accidentally on instruments I'm not I'm not familiar with. And that, Isn't that's, that that's nice? It is. It's exciting, and I think. Uh, like I said, like composing is about improvising and it's also about making a lot of mistakes and, and knowing when a mistake is like, Oh wow, that, what is that little kernel of something of five notes there? And then blowing that up into something. Can you give us an example of a time that you banged on something or scraped across something or tripped over something and it became a cue? Yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. uh, This is something I I know any composer who works a lot can relate to. This is just within my, my uh, logic, but uh, I was working on something recently and I just dragged a track up and and forgot to mute it. (laughs) And it did something with the sample beyond what the sample was capable of doing and made this sound. And I was like, Oh, that's it. That's amazing. Uh, so yeah, like that kind of stuff, but especially with, uh, um, you know, like the organ, which I'm not familiar with, or, um, uh, just, just picking up something that I did. I, I have no idea what I'm doing or like, what, like I have a baritone ukulele in there that's never tuned the way it's supposed to be. And that, then, then I'm playing, I, I find that I get locked into motor patterns, like, of course. right. And I play, I can't break away. So one way to break away is to like, just detune something and, and, and start playing it. The same things you're always playing, but different sound is coming out. How about you, harmonic patterns? <clears throat> a lot of composers yeah, will say, geez, yeah. I always play oh. the same chords. Yes. How do you break away from that? Or S- do same you? way, same way. I try. Same yeah. way. I just, just get, get somehow get unfamiliar or get lucky. Do like you, I was talking to Danny uh, uh, Elfman recently, and he was saying the same thing, that, that he'll sit down, and, and the only way you're going to come to something is by sitting down and doing something. And and just playing, 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 playing. It's all garbage. It's all garbage. And then boom, there's something there. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Do you find yourself navigating to analog <clears throat> instruments to do this tooling around, or do you go digital? You, um, uh, I mean, it depends. Again, like if it's an orchestral palette, then maybe it is uh, with orchestral instruments in Logic. But most of the time, where, when I get most excited, is it's with on instruments through microphones. You mentioned earlier <clears throat> that other composers have come in here to use the organ. Yeah. And uh, I'd just be curious, is that like, I mean, it's, it's not like Enterprise Rent-A-Car. No, it's not, yeah. But how, how does that work? First of all, is the word slowly going out, or does everyone know? Because I read about it a while ago and thought, yeah. I really have to see this. It's no secret. Yeah, it's out yeah. there. Yeah, I think, yeah I think Another composer yeah. will say, uh, hey, man, is that organ for rent well how does it work yeah i mean so this is i do look at this as like my personal writing studio i don't rent it out in the way uh, a commercial studio would get rented out having said that i i don't want to be particularly selfish about this organ because it it was a part of the whole film music community and it, it deserves to continue to be that way so as far as the pipe organ goes if i'm not working here uh, then and someone comes in and inquires uh, um then you know that it, 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 i'd love to to see it used so danny Danny Elfman used it in the Grinch, um, and uh, there. I guess I uh, a couple other composers are coming up, which I, I shouldn't say yet. But they're they've got really exciting scores that they're no, gonna, you can gonna say be using it in yeah, yeah, exactly. And do you like <laughs> provide an assistant? Uh, yeah, or is it you? Or so, if, so if you're really gonna do it right, yeah, um, I have an organist here. I have an organ tech here. Uh, the, it probably gets touched up tuned, maybe depending on how long since it's last tuning. Although it's really only ever six to eight weeks, and needs touch up. Uh, but you definitely want an organ tech here because it, it's rare. But occasionally, there's something called a cipher, and it's where a magnet uh, gets stuck open. So you're playing for the bun. There's just one note that's playing. And so you have to go up, crawl under the chests, and pull out this thing to get the thing to drop. And honestly, that's when I'm in heaven. Like, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't like, like, a panic button on my sequencer. To me, like, going up into the chamber with a flashlight on my head and, like, you know, it, it's just so exciting. That, that's well, music. you can see it on your face. When we yeah. walked into the door... You wasted no time. Come on upstairs. <laughs> and I imagine when you have a composer, Danny Elfman, come in, this mm. is probably like when you're a kid and you have a new toy. You're like, come in my room. Let me it show is. you my new toys. It is. And I, I got so excited uh, by how he, how excited he got, too. Because I think I 10 years ago, I had no idea what these instruments included as far as uh, non-pipe-related instruments and, and just what they were capable of. And so to share that experience and see so many people have that same experience is is 
is kind of what it's all about. Is there a Wurlitzer support group online? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, if you had a... Yeah, they meet here. Of, if you had <laughs> some it. sort of, uh, you know, a Ferrari or a Porsche or something that was... Right. There are all those clubs where you can call up and say, you know, I have a 58 Porsche. Is there a Wurlitzer group that if you had a question, you could put in a forum? Yeah, there, there's, it's a, it's a uh, sub, sub, sub <laughs> group of, of humanity <laughs> that, that is super passionate about it and super, I guess if you think of, we all think of Trekkies as being super particular and knowledgeable and opinionated and uh, up pipe organ folks are on a whole other level. This must be yeah. Nirvana. It is. And that was really like, I, 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 I was, that was sort of the ultimate validation was when we did our first concert here for the, the theater organ convention, American theater organ convention. Lovely. And we had a couple hundred organ nuts come through here and, the first thing they were shocked about was how mechanically quiet the instrument is in the room. When this was at Fox, all those mechanical bits, which I showed you guys, which are very noisy, were up with the pipe. So when you turned this organ on, you heard a f- 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 in the room. Uh, so you had to play something pretty loud to get above that. Mm. Um, so they were really excited about by how we managed to isolate all that mechanical stuff away from the musical components of the organ. And then just this, the organ is very... And this is an, a t- testament to Jay Kaufman and Jeff Solar, who designed and built this room. There's an incredible clarity in the room um, for the organ, but for orchestra or anything. People have compared it to Tadeo. Um, nice. And so basically, you, you can really hear every part of the organ when it's playing. In a big theater, it comes in the room, it's a wash, it's beautiful, but it's a different sound. And here, it's, it's a very... Um, uh, there's a clarity and a brilliance in the room when music is made in here that is really exciting, and, and they were excited about that too. You're 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 obviously a very humble guy, but do you do you ever just sit down and think about what you've done for Hollywood in rescuing this thing? I mean, this was sitting in boxes in a storage unit in Reno, aka it was either going to get destroyed by a flood at some point, or it was going to end up on storage wars and someone was going to be like, what is all this crap and throw it away. But you, you took this puzzle and put it back together and, and you've saved a piece of Hollywood. I mean, have you thought about it that way? Yeah. I try not to think in those grand terms in my head, but yeah, no, it's, it's when you guys come in and talk about it that way and other composers come in and talk about it that way, that's when it sort of sinks in and is really exciting. I also wonder if the fact that you've done that in some ways overshadows how great you are as a composer. It's that's a really interesting point, and and I, because look I, what we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, no, no, of course, yeah, and and what it's, you were saying. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say it's one of the things that part of this whole thing is I I want it to be a calling card as a composer, and I'm beginning to see that sort of taking off. So that that is a big part of the goal of of doing this. I would think, in other words, <laughs> when somebody calls you for a show, um, I wonder if you went down the line of people that call um is it get the guy who owns the Wurlitzer or is it hey just get Nate Barr he's a great composer he's the guy I want oh did you know he has that Wurlitzer no I don't know what you're talking about I just wanted him as a composer I wonder if it's equal if it is people are just coming to you as a composer because your work right what you're doing out there regardless of the fact that there's this other venture Right. Yeah, it's it's kind of a um, it's a mixture of both and I think only time will tell, you know. I mean I mean I have a a lot more scores in me. Hopefully they're the projects with really unique directors on films and TV shows that a lot of people see and I think it'll it'll always do this. But I I do think this is a this is a I know it's a, a completely unique thing and it's a historic thing and and i want it to be for whatever reason i'm the torchbearer for this i became so obsessed with it to give it this home and the restoration it got and so that that's i'm I'm happy that that's a part of the story you know whatever it is that's so nice now there are directors Mm -hmm. and some creatives that you do have long-standing relationships with um, I know that Eli Roth is one exactly, of them. Exactly, yeah. You've done how many pictures with Eli? I've done, I mean, uh, as as far as director, composer, we've done uh, four together with a fifth coming up, and then producing-wise, maybe another three or four on top of that. So and how did that start? That started because Eli walked into my studio two studios ago and saw my DVD collection of horror films and just saw Kindred Spirit, and I had a Fangoria subscription. He had a Fangoria subscription, and... 
it was kind of like this creative love at, at first sight. And uh, that was that was a film called Cabin Fever, which is. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And then we did Hostel and Hostel 2. And then uh, Total Deviation was House of the Clock on its Walls for both of us because it was like a Amblin kids. It was a callback to Gremlins and Goonies and all these. And that would Eli clearly has that in him as a director and a storyteller. And I, I have tons of those scores left. And it was a, it was, I say it was like one of the easiest scores I've ever written. Like I just, Amblin loved it. Uh, I, I just, I didn't even think twice. Like I, I've just, as we know, as composers in this, we are, um, we are uh, o- only able to write what a particular project needs. And so we should all be so lucky that like those great projects come along that burst open sort of a new part of our creativity that maybe hasn't been expressed yet. So. Would you consider horror the thing that sparked your <clears throat> film scoring interest? Yeah, definitely. I love horror films. Uh, we do horror nights here. Uh, me and a bunch of friends uh, every, once every six weeks or so we get people in here and, um, oh, so, we'd like to be on that list. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, it's a growing thing and I, I do think it's really fun. We, um, so yeah, it's like, uh, um, you know, I've done 30, I just finished my 38th feature. Um, mm. maybe a quarter of that is horror, but because those films are seen, but have been seen by the most people, that's what I get known for. So, so again, part of this studio and this space and this organ is, is just sort of a, a Hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing things different here you know because like, yeah, the organ yeah. is certainly one of its biggest territories is horror yeah it's no, it, gothic kind gothic of creepy exactly stuff i mean horror films yeah. it's interesting as a composer a lot of horror films i always felt could be scored by just somebody hitting a cluster of low notes on the <laughs> piano there's the bad guy yeah and that's yeah. all you need you yeah. say oh shoot that's going this something scary is going to happen that's qu- <laughs> that's evolved quite a bit now. it's evolved Nowadays, a little bit though. yeah no, no, but yeah, there's there's a there's a there's a vocabulary musical vocabulary and language that, as we all know. But I think you know. I I actually was reminded. Mm-hmm. I think we met, or you worked at, while I was at Fox on a comedy. I did because that's where I I first it was it was Broken Lizard. <laughs> yeah, it was Broken Lizard. So that's about Club as far Dread. from Club Dread. <laughs> Club. That was a horror comedy. It was a horror you're, comedy. You're right. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Club Dread. Club it's Dread. so funny. Yeah. And those, they're very funny. So did yeah. they say we need a horror guy to yeah, take was, the piss out of it? I mean, I did, uh, what did I do for them? I, I'm trying to remember that. I guess that was my first one with them. And uh, yeah, it was just like, let's do it. Yeah, they said, let's get a horror guy to do And this. sometimes, so, yeah. obviously, as we all know, the funniest <laughs> thing you can do is do it on the nose. Absolutely. Don't go... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. But play straight horror against yeah. the comic scene makes it funnier or scarier. <clears throat> and it's like Harry's score to um, uh, uh, Team America. Thank you, Team America. The, the approach to that was like, let's get Harry, action guy, to do like a straight ahead action score. And you know? truth be told, for those of you who are fans <clears throat> of film music and fans of film music history, Harry was not the first. Mm. Because someone wrote a score for that that was comic. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they looked at it and said, "The comedic part of it actually doesn't work. Let's go get an action guy." Right. And the other part of that is that Harry had ten days, right? Amazing. And he nailed Amazing. an entire movie in ten days. Which his thought when he finished it was, "Don't ever tell anyone that I could score an entire action film in ten days because they expect <laughs> me to That's do right. it." We touched on this a little bit, but before we uh, wrap up, we do want to hear about your, I know that you, you've mentioned that your parents were musicians. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, what was that upbringing like? Did, were you kind of pushed into music? Did you organically want to do it yourself? Cause you know, oftentimes the parents are, are strict and you have to take your lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, did you take a liking to it early on or did, did, did that come at, a, at an older age? My mom was a piano teacher. She could never get me or my brother to sit stalled the piano. So that went out the window. She wished us, uh, yeah, my brother and I chose cello when we were nine years old because we thought, oh, let's pick a big instrument. She'll have to pick us up after school every day and she'll let us quit. And <laughs> she was like overjoyed we picked cello. She's like, it's one of my favorite instruments, totally backfired. So definitely she was, she was a mother who put the timer on in the other room and wanted to hear us playing and practicing. So there was that for years. And then I, and then I 
as we all know, like once you meet that great, I think we all have that one teacher in our lives, right? That mm-hmm. we can go, that's the person that changed my life. And I had a cello teacher who did that. And, that and who was, was that? Her name's Maxine Newman. She's a cellist in New York. And she... Is this New York City? Yeah. And she changed my life. So she was, she was, she was the one that sort of made me appreciate that. And it's become a big part of my sounds. I'm so lucky that... Um, my f- mother and father, more my mother, kind of forced me to do it for so long, and then I, you know, Maxine took the the torch and ran with it. And this her. is elementary school, or so this is yeah. School? I started when I was nine on cello, and then I met Maxine probably when I was fourteen or something like that, fifteen. And then uh, guitar was my rebellion against like they were overjoyed that I was I was excited about something musical. Um, and then they had some weird instruments around the house. They had like a shakuhachi and a koto because we lived in Japan when I was a kid and an old ovation mandolin and uh, not uh, yeah, ovation, I think mandolin. So there was just unusual stuff around the house as far as non-Western instruments uh, in some cases that made me excited about, I was doing I, so far. I was doing what I'm doing now really young. And just it, toying uh, with instruments. Yeah, like setting up the Kodo and moving the bridges around to different pitches and trying stuff. And so it's, it's kind of, it's funny. You're kind of a musical scientist. <clears throat> I guess so. <laughs> What's interesting, though, is often you hear about musical scientists who are, have a uh, TIAC tape deck in front of right. them. And they find at nine years old that you can very speed it a little bit and yeah. you can take the tape and turn it over. You were doing it with a koto. Yeah. Because you were yeah. interested in the musical part of it. Um, does Is Maxine still with us? And does She, she know, is. Does she know? The, the fruits of her labor? She does, yeah. She That's does. Wonderful. She's wonderful. I talk to her maybe twice a year, but she's, she's a, a very spectacular musician, cellist, and person. Still yeah. teaching? Yeah, still teaching. Yeah, she was at Bennington College for years. That's so nice. And then she uh, uh, performs all over New York, and, and she's just, uh, yeah, life-changing. Do you ever go speak to her students or anything? I haven't. I haven't, but but uh, I have gone back to college and spoke to people and stuff like that. But yeah. And you grew up in New York City? I grew up in uh, Westchester County, so 15 minutes north of the city in Bronxville, a suburb of the city. Mm-hmm. So I was in the city a lot for lessons and all that very cool did living in japan <clears throat> influence any of your styles do you think yeah i, th- I think I, again i think just just an early awareness of non-traditionally western music was big time a part of yeah the i think influence. the real final question would be if there was a call for a shakuhachi on a score <laughs> would you use one of the cool samples that are available no or would you get a player to come i'd probably in? start with a sample until it was approved and then i'd get someone to come i actually have one but they're so hard to play but you hear them in Kurosawa's films. They're just so, like in Ron, it's just such a beautiful, haunting, amazing Incredible. Sound. I think you also hear a great sample in that great... Sledge oh, Hammer. Yeah. yeah, it starts <laughs> right. with a shakuhachi oh, interesting. Yeah. sample. Because I asked Peter Gabriel about that. And you think, why wouldn't you get a shakuhachi player? Yeah, of play all it? people. Of yeah. all people. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious because we met a couple of your assistants and, yeah. and your techs here. Um, yeah. And your dogs. <laughs> yes, and my dogs. With, with your magic school bus story, yeah. um, do you ever consider bringing people in that don't have film music experience just to kind of pass the torch along? Is that... I mean, I could. Yeah, absolutely. My advice to you, yeah. say absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically looking to see if you're, if I can apply. <laughs> No, I think I think it's it's I think it's uh, it's uh, important to have people here who who um, look at this as a piece of what's to come for them. I may ask for another little tour. Yeah, we're, we're gonna have to yeah. hang out and we'll sure. we'll get some more videos to post. I think we can wrap up here. Uh, we want to thank Nathan Barr for coming on the show and having us at your awesome studio. This has been a real treat. Thank you. I, I love that you guys are doing this. Thank you. And uh, we want to remind you to stick around after the show because we're going to play you an example of Spitfire Audio. And remember, use that promo code SCORE to get a third off the price. You don't want to miss that deal. It's a limited uh, time only. And uh, this has been SCORE, the podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. We want to remind the listeners as well to follow us on Twitter at SCORE, the podcast. Rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And uh, tell a friend. We're growing, and it it grows because uh, you're spreading the word. We really appreciate all of you, and someday we're going to get this theme song played on the amazing Bandrika organ. That's my dream now, (laughs) to have it all come out of this studio. Nathan, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you next week.
Hey, SCORE listeners, we're so excited for the support of Spitfire Audio as our presenting partner. They collaborate with people like Hans Zimmer and the Bernard Herman Estate to build sample libraries that elevate your music so you can sound like the pros. Or if you're already a pro, you can add to your library and just get new sounds. I mean, they have so many different choices and different sound packages, and um, we have an exclusive offer to you, our listeners. If you use the promo code SCORE, Really easy to remember. Yep. You get a third off, which is a great deal. Um, and I, I jump on it. It's only a limited time. So go to SpitfireAudio.com. I actually had a friend who uses their products message me and say, how cool that you guys have Spitfire as your presenting partner. And a third off? That's a crazy deal. Yeah, it's a good one. I jump on it. Uh, do we have an example of one of their cool Yeah, things? we're going to play you a musical demo of what some of their sounds sound like so you can get an idea of how you can elevate your music. Check it out. You can get amazing sounds like the ones you just heard and many more right now for 33.3% off, one-third off. Just go to spitfireaudio.com, check out their selection, and then when you check out, use the promo code SCORE so you can save. We'll see you next week. See you next week.